always want to say, let's not forget that absolutely the most important thing that a society can do is, is have a creative edge, so it's got an expressive edge to itself. I mean, everything else, while important, is just maintenance. We, we need to keep growing as a society, and, and that takes some creativity. My father was in uh, World War II, Army Air Corps. He had his bachelor's in agriculture and range management from the University of Wyoming, and he went on and got a master's degree. So the Department of Education had an experimental program they called nursery school. I can remember real specific things about it. Uh, and the one that stands out in my mind, I remember the day they brought clay into the room and we started to play with it. I remember how the sun came in the windows and where I was sitting, you know, things like that, that as I look back, I can see how big an impression that made on me. I mean, to get my hands into something like that, that was kind of my earliest memory of creating something. When I was quite young, we lived up in Harding County. Uh, 16 miles west of Buffalo. And then we came down to Sturgis and, and eventually moved out uh, east of Sturgis on a ranch in the Bear Butte Valley area. I think the most important thing was just the work ethic, to, to get up every morning and realize that what you did that day is gonna have a big influence on the immediate environment that you're in. And, and do something, get, it, get something accomplished. And that drive to do that has carried me through all these 50 years of being an artist. I went to the University of Wyoming as well, and I had an opportunity to go on board a, a shipboard program that still exists. And at that point, I got on board a ship in January, LA, and about five months later landed in New York, having visited 18 different countries and 23 different ports, every one university, major museums, and I saw all these things that had been created by these cultures that recorded the values and the character of that society. And I realized when I saw that, that creating objects that reflected those qualities in a culture was a worthwhile endeavor and that those items were regarded with respect and, and that they were preserved. And I thought, well, that's a worthy way to spend my time. And then I came back and, and that was in 1967 and by 68, well, I had declared myself an artist and didn't look back. One, uh, people ask me, you know, how do you, how do you be become successful? How do you do that? And, I, I say, well, you, the, the first thing you have to get accustomed to, it, and it was my experience as well, is 15 years of abject poverty. <laughs> we lived in the country, we had a milk cow, we had chickens, we, I, I bartered for groceries. I remember going to the grocery store with one of my wood assemblages and trading it for credit. You know, those kinds of things helped me get by, but, but it, was a, it was a struggle, I mean, for a long time. I have the feeling that I never really worked for money. I worked to, to do an excellent job. And sometimes I made money and sometimes I didn't. But each, by doing a good job, by, then you get to move forward to the next opportunity. Well, I took very little in terms of art training. I mean, I did, as I got into it, I went to workshops and went to the foundry and interacted with other artists. I've done some painting, but the kind of work that I enjoy is the hands-on, you know, soft clay or uh, stone or metal or, or the shaping of objects. And when I started, I started with things that I knew. I, you know, grew up in a Western environment, so it was wagons and windmills. And, and then I started to add landscape with that. 
um, made out of leathers and canvas and various things. And eventually the landscape became more interesting to me than the, than the objects in front. I definitely have raised my hand and then realized that was over my head, but I didn't back out of it. I, I hustled and paid attention and did a learning curve that was required to get the thing done. You know, it just has gone on like that one serendipitous event after another. The course of my career has been real diverse. I mean, I've done everything from assemblage to landscape-related works to uh, classic figurative pieces to complete abstractions. There are common threads that run through it all, and part of it is the, the, the sort of lyric line that I see in the mountain and prairie intersection where I live. And there's a sense of scale that has come from where I live. I try to, to respond to my environment always. And, and have something that, uh, you know, is coming from what I really am fascinated by. I've always thought that artistic license is about the, the license to keep growing, to keep innovating. I've never quite understood doing the same thing over and over. I remember having a fellow that was involved with business one time say, boy, if you just stick with what you know, you, as soon as you figure out what you're doing, you move on to something else. And it's true, I, I've done that. But I mean, that's artistic license for me. <laughs> well, the first life-size piece I did was uh, Blue Stem Woman that's in the Rapid City Public Library. And it's mostly found objects. I mean, there's a couple of cast elements to it, but it was a piece of tin that had tumbled around on the prairie, and that's what was the given that, that was the point of origin for the piece because it looked like a skirt and kind of blowing in the wind, and, and I used that in the shape that it had to, to key into this life-size figure. And I never pick things up unless I have some kind of vision when I do it, because I don't feel like I ought to disturb everything and just on the chance that I'll come up with an idea. But I have probably a, a hundred rocks out back that at one point I knew just exactly what I was gonna do with those. Um, and some of them, the vision still holds. I mean, I've always had a, a greater talent for non-linear thinking than I have for linear thinking. but. I think it's been a real asset to me as I sculpt the human form particularly because you have to drive all your horses at the same time. You can't work on an eye and get it all done and then find, oh gee, it's a half inch too low. You have to dance around the figure and do everything a little bit all over. And I would work here on one part and something would catch my eye and then I'd go work on that and oh, I'll go over there and do that. And so I was constantly dancing around the figure, moving all parts of it at the same time. So I want to say that for people that have some special ability to think in this non-linear fashion, I mean, think of it in part as an asset because it can be that. There are over a thousand pieces in Dignity. We cut them out by hand with a plasma cutter and fitted them back together like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. First time that I'd ever fabricated a face out of stainless steel. And I was awfully glad for years of experience in doing literally hundreds of human faces I try as much as possible to solve my problems on a small scale because I know once I'm committed to a certain path, there I go. I always leave some aspects of it open because I, I know that with the, this change of scale from a 
little maquette to 50 foot, there are gonna be things that change and I make those decisions when I get there. There are so many things that you, I can't I can't understand completely until I get to see it at that point in the process, and then I can make an adjustment. Well, I have to say that, I mean, of all the works I've done, I've, I, I think I've gotten more feedback uh, of a positive sort from Dignity than anything else I've done. And part of it is just the visibility of it, to be sure. Um, I hadn't, I didn't know how it would be received by the Native communities, and it seems to have been accepted in a good way. It's been a wonderful experience for me. I mean, it's a kind of highlight at 50 years into my career. Well, I, I have always hired people that are better welders than I am. I can tack things together a little bit, uh, but that's about as far as I go because so much of these big pieces particularly require hours and hours of just running a bead of weld. And there are fellows that are far better at that than I am because somebody has to stand back and look and point their finger, you right. know, and, and holler at people. And I tell them they have no idea how difficult it is to stand out here and yell all day. <laughs> For me, creating, I think, is, is so much about what I feel at that given moment, and that's why I think it's so important to keep my attention cleaned up so I can perceive those things and grasp those opportunities. I, I know that what drives me forward in part is that every piece I've ever done, there's always something I come back and look think, oh, how did I miss that? I'm, I so wish I could have understood that better, but consciousness being what it is, you, know, you do the best you can given that point in your understanding, and then later on you maybe you understand more and realize that that didn't work so well. And, but it keeps pushing me on because I, I keep wanting to, to, to get it right the next time. Well, at, at this point in time, I mean, Ark of Dreams is certainly the, the largest and in some ways the most ambitious uh, and arguably the most expensive piece I've ever done. And I think I probably won't do anything quite of this scale again. I think that uh, I would like to, to work on projects that I can do here in my studio. I started out again by drawing and this case, it was a very much a gestural drawing, and I swept that, that, that arc that went over the river, I swept that into a tail or a canopy out on each side so that there'd be a space for visitors underneath, and decided that that break in the middle was really important because you could have an, a dream or an idea in your consciousness, and you could take it a certain distance, but at some point, it always requires that you trust yourself in the future and take that leap of faith in order to complete the dream. I mean, all of us have a certain period of time that we get to act out and make manifest our, our visions of how life could be or what art should be about. And, and then we, we gradually play out and finish our statement and, and somebody has to come and take over. So never doubt that you can be that next person to, to be successful in the arts. Mm -hmm.